This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from opentuition.com. So let's have a look at fair value. It's one of the more recent accounting standards that we have within the world of IFRSs and possibly one of the most important because it was always a little bit strange in the way that IFRSs had adopted this fair value measurement principle throughout all of the accounting standards. But there was never any specific standard that dealt with the definition of fair value. Very odd. So once they'd identified that there was a standard that was missing, they decided to go through there and develop an accounting standard that told us all about fair value, which was vitally, vitally important. However, when we're going through there and using this fair value standard, it applies to all accounting standards whereby fair value is mentioned. Uh, excluding specifically IFRS 2 and your share based payment. So ignoring any fair value from this standard, there is specific rules in IFRS 2 to do with the fair value of a share based payment. And also specifically under the leases standard uh, that has specific measurement criteria as to how we value the fair value of an asset under your leases standard. Other point just to note as well, uh, this standard also does not cover standards whereby there may be similar ideas to fair value. So thinking there about is it your inventory standard? So your net realizable value, your expected selling price isn't your fair value. It's just what we expect to sell it for. And also as well, when we go through there and think about is it your intangible, oh, sorry, your impairments, uh, anything that's similar to fair value there is not dealt with under this fair value standard. But anything else, so when we look at investment property, when we go through there and look at fair value within goodwill, when we go through there and look at fair value under the revaluation model of property plans and equipment, this standard is very, very, very relevant. When we go through and look at financial assets and financial liabilities, here's the answer for your fair value. And the reason why we choose fair value is because it's the most up-to-date value, isn't it? The historic cost convention that has previously been used is great because it, it's factually accurate. It, it's verifiable going back to the, the characteristics within the framework. It's reliable, isn't it, under the, the old characteristics of the framework, but it's not so relevant, isn't it? The most up-to-date market values are much more relevant and therefore much more of a faithful representation of the company's resources over which it has control over and the obligations that the entity has. So if we can get everything to fair value, it's a much better measurement basis. And as there was no standard it was decided that we needed to create a standard, which makes sense. So first of all, what we've got there is the definition of what fair value is. So I'll go through there and learn it. So the price that will be received to sell an asset. So if you're looking to sell your building, your investment property, or to go through there and sell your investment in shares, uh, or that you are pay to transfer a liability, so if you had an obligation to pay cash, how much would you pay somebody else to go through and take that liability off your hands in an orderly transaction uh, between market participants at the measurement date? OK, so they're the key phrase that you get at the end. So the, the, expar the price that you would get from selling an asset or transferring a liability in an orderly transaction. So removing any related party aspect from market participants so we're going to use a market-based approach and it's there at the measurement date any changes in fair value subsequently are not then restated okay so if we have the measurement date and the fair value then if things change dramatically the day after it doesn't matter we take the fair value at that measurement date so what we've got there is it mentions that IFRS 13 adopts a hierarchical approach that being they're looking at the specific markets and taking those markets. And if you have a market that gives you a fair value, we will take it. And if not, we then drop down to a market that may not be traded. And then we drop down further. So what we've got there in terms of your level one inputs is that we take your quoted prices 
in an active market. So if you have shares uh, and those shares are traded in an active market, so an active market, there needs to be regular transfers and large volumes of transfers of shares going on. Then as that asset or liability that you own or owe is identical, you will use that quoted price in an active market. And the reason why is because it gives the most reliable evidence, isn't it? Uh, if it's a fair market, then that quoted price should be the most reliable evidence. So if it's reliable, it shouldn't require any adjustments. Uh, we then go through and drop down a level from our quoted prices in an active market. Uh, and we talk about some, some more observable inputs. So it could be that we don't have an identical asset or a liability. Maybe we have a share, but that share isn't traded, but there's an identical style share. So for a similar asset in an active market that we could go through there and use. So I think it mentions there, is it quoted prices for similar assets or liabilities in active markets? OK, so it's not identical, but it is similar. Uh, and it talks there about markets that are not active. So that's referring back to the share that we own. And maybe it's not an active market, but something similar is otherwise traded. We can use that similar value of that asset. The other one that we've got there is maybe that there it is no specific market, but we can go through there and use directly quoted interest rates, yield curves. So again, observable inputs. That's the key bit about level one and level two. They have to be observable. You can actually see where we get those figures from. And we can use those interest rates and use the yield curve to go through there and, and value our bonds that we have within our financial assets. Sounds a little bit complicated, but provided that you have observable inputs, uh, you can use those observable inputs as level two. Uh, level three is essentially just a well-educated guess. And it talks there about unobservable inputs. So there's very little with regards to an active market. There's very little things that are observable in terms of interest rates or yield curves. Uh, so there's nothing similar to what you're doing on the market, but you need to come up with a fair value. So what you could go through and do that is use your own data. Obviously, that would need to be audited data. And maybe that data might be to do with cash flows. So cash inflows and outflows that you generate into the future. And when you've got those cash flows, maybe you could discount them back to present value using a suitable discount rate to work out the fair value. Or maybe you could go through there and use some other model, maybe a dividend valuation model to go through there and value your shares. The key bit is that they are unobservable inputs. There's nothing there physically that exists on any markets to help you with your analysis. As I said, it is just a well educated guess. And again, from a P2 perspective, this is really good discursive aspects of the syllabus, because what you can do there is you can define what fair value is. You can talk about the three inputs and then you can come to a conclusion over which fair value you are going to use. You know, there's, there's five things there which ties in quite well, doesn't it, to questions worth four or five or six marks in potentially question two or question three. So it's quite a new standard. Uh, and again, another really good question to go through in practice is one of the recent questions from current issues. Obviously, this is now an accounting standard, so won't be covered in current issues again for a long, long time until some of the bits become less relevant. But that's unlikely to happen in the short term. But if you go back and attempt the past exam question in current issues on fair value, applying what we have here, then what you'll go through and find is that if anything on fair value crops up within question two or question three, then you shouldn't have too many difficulties whatsoever. So other than that, that's the end of that chapter and I'll see you all in the next one.